You're listening to CKMS, FM Radio 102.7. You're listening to CKMS Community Connections. My name is Bob Jonkman. Today on the show, we have Martin Asling from WR Yimby. Welcome to the show, Martin. The show, Martin. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Can you tell me a little bit about what WR Yimby is? Uh, yeah, so... Wadley Region, Yes in My Backyard, were an organization that formed in 2019 in order to advocate for for more housing in our community, for more housing affordability, as well as uh, just to, as, a, as another voice to counter the type of not in my backyard thinking that, that prevails in our region. And while we do often focus on housing, our concerns aren't just with nimbyism regarding housing we're also concerned about you know things like uh supervised consumption sites which can be real lifesavers uh for for people in our communities and um ultimately those kind of decisions you know should be made at a you know at a at a broader scale while considering the the needs of people that are that are most affected and uh so forth supervised consumption sites you know those most affected are those that are um, that are that are using drugs and that um, that aren't simply going to quit tomorrow just because we might want them to, but um, you know we still have a responsibility as a community to do whatever we can to um, keep them as safe as possible and give them other options and opportunities to um, you know to have other options to deal with the the type of um, sometimes severe trauma that they might be dealing with. And, you know, one of the reasons people, you know, use, you know, so-called hard drugs um, and particularly to, to, to uh, a large extent is mm -hmm. because there's something going on. And part of um, helping people move forward is building the type of relationship. And part of building that relationship is um, having that kind of trust where you're um, able to, to, to help people, help people uh, minimize the, the risk and build that type of relationship. I kind of got um, <laughs> more broadly into the supervised consumption site yeah, type yeah. Um, talk, but I think that's important to emphasize because sometimes people might think of us as just as uh, a housing group. And I think that people that might be interested in our work simply because, you know, they might be a relatively well-off middle-class person that's nonetheless very concerned about rising housing costs, and they might identify one of those problems, I think, correctly as being that when we think about housing, uh, particularly when we think about new housing, we, we, we think of it more as a problem rather than a, a solution. And we think um, far too locally, which some often seems like a good thing, but you have to think more broadly, geographically speaking, because that there, there's a, that, that would include the broader a spectrum of people that are actually affected by whether or not, uh, uh, there's a, a new housing development. And once you think of things in those terms, then um, I think it's natural to also think of, um, you know, if you're thinking about something like a supervised consumption site, it's not just whether or not the neighborhood wants it. The neighborhood might particularly see um, what they see as the downsides, um, but they might not um, see all the potential upsides that would be more broadly spread out. So once you understand that logic that um, you have to think of the the effect on the broader community, not just the immediate neighborhood as much as, and, and I don't dismiss their concerns, but they're just not the only stakeholders, the people that we should be concerned about. Yeah. Um, so, so that's part of, part of what we're trying to do is to um, bridge those kind of um, gaps in, 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 in our community where maybe the, the middle class kind of person that is, is thinking about, you know, the, the high cost of housing even for people that are middle class, um, I, I think it's important to think of how some of the same forces at play are also making life very, very difficult for people that are in much more difficult situations. Yeah. So, for example, and this is, you know, um, I, I know we're here to talk about the uh, the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force. Yeah. We'll One of there. the things that they recommended, which is a very good thing, I think, is um, allowing as of right multi-tenant homes throughout the province and um, multi-tenant homes um, city of kitchener zoning bylaw 
um, considers them, calls them lodging homes. Um, and in, in the city of Kitchener, that's, you know, five or more people sharing a, you know, in the same building, but with some shared space, like a shared kitchen, maybe bathrooms, you know, that's a lodging home as opposed mm -hmm. to an apartment building where everything is um, onto itself, the bathroom and, and same, so far. Same thing as boarding um, houses? So there are immediate effects of nimbyism for people that are uh, most marginalized when you're looking at supervised consumption sites, when you're looking at Hang on, Martin. I think we've lost you there for a second. Um, let me just see if I can get you back into the fold here. Uh, not entirely sure where your voice ended up going to. We'll, um, we'll play a little bit of music and uh, see if we can uh, get the uh, technical issues solved. Um, so give me Would a moment you know here. When, when you started to lose me, I, so I can kind of... Oh, okay. Um, it was uh, shortly after I asked about boarding houses, and, and you were explaining some of the um, the issues with the uh, Ontario uh, definitions. I think um, I couldn't hear you, so I'm not really entirely okay. sure uh, what what the thread of the conversation. Is. But carry on. Um, you seem to be back at this point. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there they can be called uh, lodging homes, rooming homes, boarding houses, multi-tenant homes. Uh, according to the city of Kitchener, which includes lodging homes in their in, in their in their bylaw, uh, a, a lodging home is you know five or more tenants uh, sharing uh, you know aspects like a, a kitchen, and so as opposed to uh, apartments you know on their own with the, with their own kitchen and, and bathroom and, and so on, lodging homes or multi-tenant homes are much more likely to be affordable immediately, and I think you know that's because they're kind of shared spaces and also because um, you know it's it's easier to convert something to a lodging home than it is to you know build an entirely new uh, structure um, mm -hmm. and that would be another reason why they're um, a more immediately affordable uh, solution to our housing crisis is, is and tenancy in, in those lodging houses typically on a, uh, a weekly basis or, or a monthly basis I'm sorry is the rent for lodging houses typically on a weekly basis or a monthly basis? daily basis perhaps even uh so i mean i mean if you're thinking kind of like of lodging home as the old kind of like it, it has a very long tradition so i think it can make people think of that type of place where where um you know you might be paying by night or something but um i, I think for the like if, think of lodging home as just the term that is used for for really anything that is um five or more um people sharing sharing uh a building like you know with your own room but with, with shared uh space so you know it would be you know just kind of typical rental okay. um with that kind of monthly rent situation okay so uh, the name of your organization is wr yimby which is a, a variation on nimby not in my backyard yeah. so Although you're advocating for housing and and um, and consumption sites and and uh, just generally social services, you're not actually delivering those social services, are you? No, no. no. Instead, no, you're the advocacy ad group to to make these social services acceptable in the community. Yes, we're an advocacy group. We we actually don't have funding. Uh, we're we're entirely volunteer run. So um, yeah, so we're not yeah. we're not providers, and I think that. Um, we definitely need uh, providers. They play a very important role in our community. And but one thing that we have as an advocacy group is we're focused entirely on that. So um, you know, you know that means that we can be as um, upfront as we want about uh, about anything. Um, and and I think that's that's important too. But um, yeah, I, they're all they're all very important. And not having any funding, uh, you can take controversial stands because there's no fear of losing the funding that you haven't got in the first place. Yes, and, and I hope that our stands are not controversial, and if they are, I hope that they're not controversial for long because I think that, you know, ultimately, there is a pretty simple logic to what we stand for. It doesn't, I, I, I don't mean to say that everything's simple in housing politics. It absolutely isn't, but I think ultimately you have to also um, narrow things down to... Um, 
to kind of first principles, right? And and to us, the really important first principles are, you know, if you're opposing a development somewhere, where else do you want it to go? And sometimes people say, well, I have an answer to that. I want it to go in this neighborhood. But the problem is, in that neighborhood, they also don't want housing, right? I mean, the, the harder question is, why is it better to have housing somewhere else instead of here? And that question is often avoided because people don't think of the um, the trade-offs and the consequences, right? Ultimately, um, if someone's proposing uh, housing, uh, that's because they believe down the line, at least, that that housing is going to be uh, filled with people. And, you know, that means if you, if you don't allow that housing, at least not at that scale, the people that would be there will be competing for housing somewhere else. And ultimately, that will drive up costs and that will, you know, make the you know, the, the newer housing that isn't that new still be the newest housing because the, the newer housing wasn't built or wasn't built at the scale that um, people actually needed it at. Yeah. So, um, you know, so, so ultimately we, you know, we call for more housing overall, but in particular, we focus on things like lodging homes because they're more likely to be yeah. immediately affordable. Having said that also, you know, if you think of the most expensive housing type, uh, on average, um, that's the single detached home. And what's most um, privileged in our zoning? Well, it's the single detached home. That's the easiest yeah. thing to to have. Um, you know, if as you get denser, there are zones where it's not allowed as of right, where there's more barriers in place um, b before you can have that type of uh, housing. And so one of your points of advocacy is to um, advocate to municipal councils to loosen the zoning laws to allow a wider variety of housing all across the city. Yes, so that would include townhomes, apartment buildings, mid-rises, um, and that kind of thing. And I think that that's, that's really part, not just because those types of homes um, are more likely to include rental and more likely to be affordable over time, but you also have to think of that overall uh, amount of housing that we have and um you know the, the the easiest way to think of you know whether or not housing scarcity matters is if, if you hear if a friend tells you oh i'm looking for a place um and uh i, I found out that there's 100 people competing for um my unit your yeah. your obvious reaction and understanding is going to be wow that's going to be really tough to find that place at a good price because yeah. there's there's a lot more demand than that um than that unit allows. So, so when, you, when you talked uh, earlier about scaling up the housing, you weren't really talking so much about quantity because you know we have lots of single detached houses at the moment. You were talking more about variety of um, accommodations. Well, I would say I'm talking about both, right? I think, but um, as kind of getting into the, you know, we have we have a joint letter with um, with Hold the Line and mm -hmm. Hold the Line. Um, as well as, and, and this is something we agree with them on, a hold the line is about maintaining the countryside line. Yeah. So there are um, avenues where when we say we want more housing, we don't mean at any cost whatsoever. Parks are important, clearly. Um, you know, the countryside line is important. It's important to not sprawl out mm -hmm. into infinity. That's not a sustainable way to provide housing yeah. environmentally. Um, it also, you know, it might lead to kind of cheaper housing out on the outskirts, but then you have, it means that you have to drive and that yeah. takes up your time yeah. and takes up your money as well. Can you give a quick explanation um, of, of what the countryside line is and how hold the line is involved with that? I, I, I worry about um, speaking for them too much, but, you know, <laughs> there's a, but there is a countryside line and the idea is to um, not develop further than, than the countryside line in order to protect farmland. And also, I think this is something that really um, resonates with us in order to prevent urban sprawl. And, and, sprawl and that countryside is, line is defined in the region of Waterloo um, municipal development policies. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah the, region, uh, the region is responsible for that. And one yeah. of the challenges is, um, you know, the region have, um, you know, when th there, are, there are a lot of groups, a lot of people that also want to maintain that countryside line. And I think Hold the Line does a good job of talking about both maintaining that line and um, also having the types of uh, zoning policies that make it sustainable 
to 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 hold the line mm-hmm. and make it possible to hold the line and that means um growing up instead of out yeah there's a lot of up, yeah a lot of pushback from the developers on having a countryside line yeah and i think you know i mean developers want to build where they want to build and sometimes the constraints we put are not constraints that are actually in the public interest like with uh with building um mid rises or, or townhomes throughout throughout the city right we need more housing but that doesn't mean that it can just be any ultimately i mean the way i think about it is uh you know there's the reason why there is a key difference to me where i will um you know developers might not like us if we're talking about the countryside line but they might like us if we're advocating for more housing within cities yeah. ultimately the the difference that i see between those two things is with the countryside line uh you know that's about limiting sprawl and sprawl is something that negatively affects all of us right we are in a climate crisis and one of the big reasons that we're in a climate crisis is that we're driving everywhere and anywhere we need to build the kind of communities where we're less reliant on cars and that means having denser communities it also means not sprawling out yeah. and so we want to do that two ways by allowing more housing within cities and to prevent um, too much sprawling out and right. ultimately those are those are things that affect the broad community the environment i mean is the ultimate um uh, issue that doesn't understand borders right um whereas when it comes to the you know there are certainly people that don't want um taller buildings or dense housing in yeah. their neighborhoods but the difference there is whatever um problems they see and some of them are very real but very localized problems and sometimes they're overblown because i think you know for example people think worry about traffic but maybe they don't think of the extent to which a more dense development will appeal to people that don't own cars for example and particularly when it's close to the downtown as it often is um but even more but if you accept that there may be more traffic in a neighborhood because of a development, um, if, if you start with that premise, that's not a, um, that's not a broad um, negative consequence. That's actually just the moving of traffic where it would have potentially been um, otherwise to a different location. And if anything, the broad effect um, that, that affects everyone is that there's less likely to be traffic overall when you allow for more dense housing types because it makes um, public transit more viable yeah. and it makes walkability um, more more yeah. viable as well because you have more things and more people in a in a smaller um, exactly. geographical space where you can get to more of the things you need because no there are need, more people around yeah. to provide it. No need for, for cars or even less need for transit if everything is right close at hand. Yes, yeah. yes. So the Ontario government has just recently re- released a report. Yeah. Um, I thought it was a, a Waterloo Region report that had been released, but I was mistaken. Um, right. Can you uh, summarize what was in the report? So the first thing to understand about this report um, from, the, uh, from the government of Ontario, so that kind of c- collected a, a, a group of people um, and... You know, it, it was kind of uh, some criticized it for for being kind of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, developers and kind of um, not enough uh, kind of housing advocates from the outside. But there were also people um, involved with, say, Habitat for Humanity. But ultimately, this report was very, um, it was very specific to the issue of the lack of supp- uh, housing supply. Uh, now the report did actually, you know, in its appendix, talk about um, other other things that can and should be done, and I think those were, um, you know, worthy parts where I would go further. But ultimately, um, you know, we believe that supply is just one piece of the puzzle, particularly when it comes to uh, the more deep affordability, where um, it, it it makes sense to simply provide that housing or provide um, subsidies to people, however you want to do it. Um, but to provide the kind of subsidies to make housing more affordable to uh, people that are most uh, economically, um, you know, that have the least income and wealth. Yeah. And, and I think it's important to support them 
uh, directly through through housing subsidies or through house or through um, subsidized housing directly. Yeah. This report doesn't deal with that because that wasn't what the report was um, was yeah. tasked with. Um, to me, that doesn't mean that the recommendations in the report um, aren't also valuable, but they're limited. They're limited by um, by the Ontario government's uh, mandate that they gave them. Right. Uh, so it's important to talk about the, the broader spectrum, but this report talks about the, the supply of housing, and it has some and it has some good recommendations, um, particularly when it comes to um, you know. Uh, having as of right zoning of six to 11 stories on transit routes with no minimum parking requirements. That's so, recommendation nine. If you're, yeah, we'll, you're we'll have, that. we'll have a link to the report um, and the okay. hold a line and WREMB reply yeah. to that from on our website, uh, radiowaterloo.ca slash CCC and scroll yeah. down to today's episode. You'll be able to get all those links on the yeah. website. So and, yeah. And to mention two other um, recommendations that we, would strongly support would be the the as of right residential zoning um so that's up to four units and four stories as of right secondary uh, suites and rooming houses lodging homes multi-tenant homes mm -hmm. um so, so so that's really important to have at least um some measure of density throughout throughout our cities that that's really important um particularly because one of the big problems with our our zoning, we have kind of this idea that we have these different zones where we allow for different types of housing. And it's kind of taken for granted that we have different zones and different zones should have different levels of, of density. And we need um, zoning to kind of maintain that. And you often hear um, talks about neighborhood character in stable residential neighborhoods um, as kind of almost um, inherently positive things that need no further debate, right? Neg neighborhoods need to maintain their character. We need to maintain yeah. uh, these stable neighborhoods. But I have a big problem with that. And, and a big part of that comes from, you know, the the push for, to, for what's often called exclusionary zoning or economic zoning, particularly if you look at the United States, but you can see it in Canada as well um, with, you know, influential planners like uh, Harlan, Bartholomew, who's who comes from way back, but um, but he was uh, he was you know quite a racist person who wanted to use uh, basically economic zoning to kind of have the type yeah. of uh, segregation that right. um, was no longer viable. The redlined uh, districts. Yeah, ultimately, um, I mean, when when people talk about redlined districts, it's not just about redlining redlining is an important part of it but um a big part of why you have these districts that are um that are segregated by 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 race and income and you know that still exists to some extent um the reason why you you, you have those is that when uh, so for example in the united states when um explicitly racist zoning was no longer allowed was no longer constitutionally viable that's when you had this push towards economic zoning this push towards saying this neighborhood has to be you know ownership single detached homes not dense this neighborhood can have apartment buildings the neighborhoods that were allowed to have apartment buildings those were the historically um you know majority black neighborhoods whereas the majority white neighborhoods were yeah. more likely to be single detached now you might look hear that and say well that was then, this is now. We have our own reasons for doing things now. <laughs> Ultimately, um, if, if you had that type of strategy um, and if you use that same type of strategy, that same type of policy where you have some neighborhoods which are where you allow much less density than others um, and those neighborhoods tend to be wealthier often, if that worked for the very you know vile aim of uh maintaining racial segregation or and income segregation then i think it should give you a lot of pause if you're if, if you're thinking that what we have now is simply um simply the way it is right yeah. you know i think one of the important insights from the anti-racist movement is that you're 
it doesn't matter so much what you feel your motivation is now. Um, what matters is, is, is the consequences. One of the reasons we have concepts like structural racism, and I think this is also, um, you know, racism by way of classism and kind of maintaining these, um, you know, whatever. Yeah, the, the uh, segregation of, of, of the zoning. Yeah. And, and yeah. How, does the, how does this Ontario report address that kind of segregation? So they talk a little bit about the disparate impacts of um, not having enough housing and, and how it can disproportionately harms people that are younger, um, people that are newer to Canada, you know, um, people that are less likely to be um, older, whiter, um, wealthier. Um, so it talks a little bit about that. It doesn't talk about it a ton. I think it could have talked about it a lot more, but it does mention it. Um, and what they propose ultimately is, you know, the, the kinds of things that, uh, that, 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 I, that I mentioned. I think that allowing um, much more dense housing in so-called um, stable neighborhoods, I wouldn't say it's much more dense housing. I mean, their, their recommendations are still um, pretty, um, you know, they're, they're, they're saying up to four units and four stories as of right, secondary suites and, and rooming ho ho homes. Well, what, um, do, what does that mean, so, as of right? I saw that mentioned in, in uh, the As letter. of right, yes. Yeah. So as of right, so in kind of zoning parlance, so so basically as of, so you might have a zone where a certain housing type, say townhomes are not allowed as of right, or, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean you can never have that type of housing. The problem is, so, you know, you can apply for a variance for, you know, maybe changing mm -hmm. the, um, the height limit of something that you want to build. And you see that happening all the time. And whenever there's a story about a building that people don't want at a certain height and all this kind of controversy surrounding it, that's usually because they're asking for a variance. Something wasn't allowed as of right. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's an important subtlety to, to, you know, to recognize that if something isn't allowed as of right, it doesn't mean that it's not going to be allowed, yeah. period. However, having said that, um, the process by which you, you know, ask for a variance, go to meetings, hear from neighbors that are often vehemently opposed to <coughs> even, you know, an, an additional one or two stories, it's, it's still a significant barrier. But when, 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 when someone's saying as of right, they mean um, it's not something that you need an additional variance for. And I think that's that, that's an important thing. So to allow a certain type of housing yeah. where it's not something that you need to, um, you know, go to a bunch of meetings where people are very upset and angry at yeah. even the slightest increase in, in density. It sure seems to me that an awful lot of council meeting time is taken up by variance requests and then the delegations opposing those variance requests. Yes. Uh, yes. So if this is just built into the housing policy in the first place, that would prevent a, a whole bunch of that. Um, essentially wasted time by councils. Yes, and one of the recommendations, and this is something that we have, um, I think in the joint letter, there's kind of a nuanced take on it. It is kind of under the bad, but I think if you read kind of the, what we say about it, we identify some of the issues with the status quo. So the, the recommendation by the task force is to limit the number of meetings, of such meetings to, um, to kind of what is um already um the minimum in the planning act so don't don't go over those number of meetings and the issue there is i think that this needs a um this requires a broader conversation because the way we uh, often talk and think about these planning issues and when we think of kind of localized um these localized questions is we think of um, you know, having meetings and such as allowing for more democratic engagement. And, and, and in one sense, that's clearly true, you know. I mean, you, you can simply say the more engagement, the better. The more chance councillors get to hear from their constituents how they feel about something, that seems like a very positive thing. And I think for that reason, uh, we were both hesitant to kind of support um, a calling for less meetings 
without a broader conversation of what that means, because ultimately, I like Water Region Yimby, or uh, you know myself in particular, I um, I feel that in a lot of ways that having these conversations at this very small scale is in a lot of ways less democratic, because. If, uh, if a developer asks for a variance because they want to build more housing um, than is allowed as of right, the people that would be affected by more housing are pretty spread out throughout the community, right? And they're, yeah. um, they might hypothetically be either moving into that new building or, you know, they could also be affected and, and you know, by the fact that, you know, someone else moves in and that means that they're not going to oh. be competing for that person for right. housing. So as, as people move into this new housing, um, those are people who are not currently living in that particular community area but are affected by it. And then the housing yeah. that gets freed up and becomes available to others is also an effect of new housing development somewhere else. Yeah, so, I mean, the people that are affected, they might live in, the, in, in that sense. They might live in the neighborhood. They might not. They might live in the city. They might live in the region. Mm. Um, regardless, if they or they might even live outside the region, regardless they should still have standing as far as people that should be listened to. Um, but when we focus inter- the conversation so much on this new development, and not even in, te- um, in some ways it's, you know, the, the way we talk about things, but even, even when it's unintentional, it still has that effect because we're talking about one development at a time. If we're talking more broadly as a community, how much housing do you want? You often find that people are much more supportive of housing when that question is asked more broadly and when, when it's asked as an overall question, not simply in your neighborhood. So there's a concept uh, uh, of a uh, collective action problem, right? Where yeah. I might benefit from this overall increase in housing, right? But you don't want it in your backyard. <laughs> right. But when it's in my backyard, I see whatever I see as the potential negatives, I see them very immediately, right? I see this, um, you know, I imagine this tall building. I, that's not there yet, but I, you know, and I, I see tall buildings nearby. I, I think of the traffic, I think of the noise. I, I think of all the things that affect me directly. Whereas when I think of the benefits, they're, you know, they're spread out and, you know, I, I get a small bit of that benefit. Yeah. Um, so, so, so the problem is, you know, even though I can understand in a, um, in a broader sense that, well, these questions are, these debates are happening all throughout the region. And maybe I would benefit from, if we could all agree to just allow more housing, we would all benefit because we would get those broader benefits of, of more housing affordability, as well as other benefits of, you know, living in a city with other people, um, you know, opportunities and things like that. But I'm when it's building by building, it's the it's those immediate um, negative or seemingly negative effects, um, and so that the, the kind of collective action problem is you have that disconnect between what you know might or may not know, but what might be best for all, and what is best for you in that one example, um, and and the way to kind of address those collective action problems, I think, with the zoning is to have those conversations more broadly so you're not just thinking of of the negative effect, effects on you of one development but of the entire effect on the entire community of allowing for more housing and it kind of forces you to think of it as actually a political thing which you know there, there was one line in the report talking about taking politics out of it i um in some ways i think it's actually taking politics in we think of politics as a negative but what 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 i mean is a recognition that these are you know broad debates that have effects on a broad number of people it's not just well what are the consequences for for my neighborhood what are the overall effects and and there are um there are winners and, and losers but ultimately the winners of housing scarcity are the um you know, homeowners that see rapid yes. increases in their property values, whereas renters and people looking to get into the market, yeah. people that are less well off are the, are the losers. I'm not, not sure how much that increase in property value really has an effect, because if you were to um, leverage that additional value in your house by selling it, 
you have to buy another house at an equally inflated price. So I'm not really that sure. That's a good point. And yeah. I think that, um, you know, there, I, I think that's something that's sometimes understood, but maybe not all the time. I think there's a lot of fear when it comes to property values. Um, and people are, are very risk averse, particularly when it comes to things like property values. Mm -hmm. um, so they're very fearful of anything that might lower their property values, even though property values have been increasing um, for, for, for quite a while now. Uh, but I think that is a very good point that in some ways homeowners benefit, but it's, it, it's a bit of a, um, they're, they're, it's kind of like golden handcuffs in a way. You, you, yeah. You're absolutely right. You can, you, you can sell your home, but then, but then what are you going to buy? Um, yeah. yeah. There's another point in your letter um, about um, tribunal fees. Yes. So there is a problem where it, the, the risk of taking something to tribunal can very much um, delay and prevent much needed housing. So, I mean, that's the, the reasoning behind increasing the tribunal fees. But I think the, the challenge with that, with using, and, and this is, I, I think this is kind of a, a problem overall, whenever you're trying to use fees as a means of um, changing someone's behavior or preventing someone from doing something. Um, the, the challenge is that, you know, that will affect those that are less well off much more than it affects those that are well off. Yeah. I'm not, so, so they do call for increasing the, the fees for um, bringing something to a tribunal because, you know, basically you're, you're, you're challenging um, a, a development, uh, changing that from 400 to 10,000, which is quite a large increase. And it's meant to reflect the fact that, um, well, for one thing with the, with the tribunal, um, unlike uh, in a court, you, in a regular court, you can't um, say if the developer wins, they can't say, okay, um, the, the, the ruling can't be that then the, those that are challenging the development at the tribunal have to pay their legal fees. Yeah, yeah. So there's kind of that, that issue. Huh. But ultimately, I, I, I think we have to think harder about how do you actually limit these types of problems in a way that's more, um, that's more egalitarian in its, in its outcomes and its way of thinking about mm -hmm. things. I think that allowing more housing as of right is really important in that respect, um, that there aren't so many uh, challenges just for, just for trying to increase the supply of housing, yeah. but with the tribunal fees, um, and this is not something where everyone that kind of identifies as YIMBY might agree with, but I think ultimately um, the increasing the, the size of the tribunal fee it probably won't affect those that are more well off that can, um, you know, still scrounge up that amount of money. And then of course there's, you know, their own legal yeah. fees as well. Whereas it might make a difference for, for people that are um, less, um, less able to yeah. scrounge up money. So if, I think that's if there's more housing as of right, um, in order to prevent these long council meetings where there's variance requests and, and objections, if there's more housing as of right available, wouldn't that increase the people going to tribunal because they have no recourse at the local municipal council any longer to address their objections? I, I think it would just, having more housing as of right would increase the amount of uh, tribunal hearings that would take place. Right. I was thinking of kind of more broadly the the kind of barriers towards building housing so i mean i think yeah when it comes to these um yeah when it comes to these tribunals i yeah i do think it's kind of a a, a problem that that needs addressing i'm just not sure if the i'm not, I'm not sure if the fee is the right tool to do that yeah. i think um but it, it it's not something that i'm that certain about um but it is um yeah. Won't know until it happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. The um, the letter from uh, WREMB and Hold the Line has um, an interesting uh, answer to that, the Local Planning Appeals Support Center. Yes. Can you um, tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah, let me just, um, I'm just going to, 
So the local planning appeal support center was something where the uh, where the funding was cut. This no longer um, exists, does it? Yes. So cut to that extent. Yes. Um, so that's something that existed under the previous government, and it uh, kind of gave the opportunity to kind of um, educate people on on the process. And in some ways, um, that might help people that are looking to appeal, um, that are kind of looking to challenge a development. But at the same time, the hope here is um, particularly um, if we require appellants to consult with the uh, local planning appeal support center before going to tribunal, it can help, um, as we say, it scope their objections to the issues that truly have bearing on the application in question. So I think that, you know, there's that opportunity there with that um, um, local planning appeal support center, if, it, if it's brought back to, you know, maybe someone comes and they have a concern, maybe after talking with the, with, 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 with the center, um, with the experts there, they might understand that, um, that it's not actually, you know, something, a valid thing to bring to the tribunal. And that can save everyone time. That can save them time. That can save, um, you know, the people that are looking to move into this new housing time. Um, it can save the entire system time. So there's there's that opportunity um, that, uh, that could potentially uh, lead to less, um, or, or, or the very least, um, less frivolity in, in uh, tribunals. Right, right. Let's, let's turn to what's actually happening in Waterloo Region at the moment. There's been lots and lots and lots of development going on. Um, yeah. Has it actually resulted in an increase of the housing supply? And has it resulted in an increase of a desirable housing supply? Well, I think there are a few things that you have to consider first. I mean, I, I kind of agreed almost reflexively. But it's true to a certain extent. There is a lot of a certain type of development in a certain um, area, geographical area, um, that is being developed. And that's kind of part of a longstanding regional um, policy and just kind of um, focus, which is, you know, of development near um, light rail transit. There's still a lot of instances where there isn't development, even along the transit lines, where there's still um, significant pockets where it's much less dense than you would expect or want to have near transit. And then on top of that, you have all the areas where um, it's still very, uh, very low rise residential. I think ultimately when sometimes you hear people say, uh, and in, in, in reference to uh, KW, K Kitchener, Waterloo um, and, um, and Toronto, where there are a lot of cranes, there's a lot of tall buildings being built in a very specific geographical area. And the kind of reflexive thing to say, and you know, people that are, um, a lot of people have said this just, you know, to, to, to quote a Trumpism, um, you know, just look out the window and um, you know, you, you, you'll see lots of developments, you'll see lots of cranes. Well, that's true, but the, the what you really need to be asking yourself is, you know, look at the, um, the 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 increase in demand. Is that demand being met? Yeah. And I think it's being met for a segment of the population that isn't actually using that development for housing. I've heard a statistic that as much as one third of those condominium high-rise towers are sitting empty because they're being used as investments rather than to actually house people. Yeah. So I have a few things to say about that. First of all, I, I think, first of all, I think the, the role of investment in housing is very, is very important. Sometimes it's used, um, the, the topic of investment in housing is used to kind of minimize the importance of supply. And you've seen a couple, um, UW planners, including, uh, Brian Doucette, mm -hmm. um, you know, talk about that in the Waterloo Region record and elsewhere. Um, there, so a few things to say. First of all, when we talk about empty homes, uh, we, we have to be more specific. So sometimes the, um, the, st uh, the statistics on um, empty homes are, they include cases where the owner 
isn't living in 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 the in the unit but maybe they're renting it out if they're renting it out that is still housing for people in fact we need rental housing we desperately need rental housing. yeah yeah now but focusing entirely on say cases where someone is um holding on to it for investment and not renting it out i think you have to ask yourself first of all like what kind of scenario would it be where that's a profitable thing to do? You make money by renting things out. You must be so confident that the, that the uh, unit will continue to increase in price at enough of a rate where it, it's not even worth it financially to rent it out because maybe there's a bit of, you know, because there's risk there with renting it mm-hmm. out. Um, but, you know, you get, you get a pretty steady income if, if you rent it out. So, I mean, I, I think for that, to even happen for that to be a possibility the problem already has to be there which is the predictable increase in 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 cost of housing and uh so so you probably heard of uh blackstone of course which uh has been buying up single detached homes in the united states and uh their subsidiary invitation homes they spoke to the securities and ex- well they you know they had their filing at the securities and exchange commission and they and this is where you're speaking to your investors right and you you better have you know a good argument and good kind of um something solid to say to your investors otherwise they you know lose confidence in you um and so, so what they said to their investors at the securities ex- and exchange commission through their filing is that they will continue to invest in areas that are, you know, high demand and low supply, and they identify increases to supply as the risk. So there's, hmm. I, so I definitely agree that empty homes are a problem if they are truly empty homes and not rented out. Right. I, I definitely agree that the role of investment in housing is a problem. What I the part that I disagree with is the suggestion you sometimes hear that that um, that means that supply isn't that important. And hmm. I think ultimately, you know, what it means if if some of the homes are empty, that means that we're still not addressing the supply nearly right, as much as, right. as we need to. So um, if, if these but, units are being rented out, it still hasn't fully addressed the issue of available rental housing. There was an article on the, on the CBC uh, just this past week or so uh, saying that the the cost of rental is skyrocketing as much as the cost of, of actual ownership is. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of this uh, rent eviction taking place, people being evicted for, with yes. the um, alleged uh, reason for uh, the unit needs renovation or that they're being evicted because allegedly family members are moving in. Um, and I've actually seen on the social media that that is actually being blamed on organizations like YIMBY um, advocating for uh, additional housing. And then when it comes to market, it's coming to market in unaffordable, uh, at unaffordable prices. Um, can you give a, a quick response to that? I just want to make sure I understand the argument fully first so i'm not sure that i understood the argument myself to be honest no no i understand (laughs) um but you know the the argument that i'm that i'm responding to because i i've I've heard variations of that um that but but i just want to make sure that i'm responding to what you've heard or or what you feel is uh, essentially blaming increased uh rental costs on the activism of organizations looking for additional rental housing, causing the market to spike because of the increased demand caused by advocacy groups like W or uh, YIMBY. So the increased demand for housing. Which is causing people to, housing. landlords to do rent evictions and, and evictions uh, for, for family members, allegedly, and then you know, turning it over again a few months later uh, at you know, double, triple the original rental price, having displaced people from a low income rental to unaffordable rentals so i mean that's it's not a position i i (laughs) I agree with i I think one of the best uh ways to talk about that maybe is you know there was a recent development uh proposal where you know ultimately one of the why we want 
more housing is that you know, we recognize that there is a large demand for housing. With more housing to begin with, that demand for housing is less likely to displace existing housing, right? If you build new housing, if you build 100 units, that's 100 people that would otherwise be competing with others for housing and uh, greater incentivizing, you know, landlords of a particular um, building to renovate the people that are already living there because they can make a lot more money because they know that that demand is there. Um, to, to use kind of one example, there was a, a development, um, oh, I have to remember where it is, but it was, um, there, there was a recent development that um, I believe it was on Mill Street. And this was a, an example where the developer wanted to convert, you know, there were some homes there, some rental homes um, that would be removed to build uh, a, a kind of um, a condo, so-called tower, and um, some, some townhomes. And we had, as a Yimby organization, we had mixed feelings about that particular development because we knew that that development would itself, that exact development would directly lead to the displacement of people. We also understood that without that development, the, the people that would have been living in that development would be competing with other people for housing, yeah. which would likely also lead to displacement probably just because of the math of it, there being many more people um, that, that, are, that are currently housed in that area, it would probably lead to more displacement. But so, so what are you to do? This, is, this sounds like an impossible situation with no solution. That's Right. So w w when we spoke to council, uh, Kevin White spoke at uh, council, and he, he basically said that we're, you know, very, we're very concerned about the displacement, but we also recognize that the that this housing also provides a need and may, you know, um, and probably will prevent further displacement elsewhere. The one line which we said, which I think I very much stand by, was where we said the worst case scenario would be if this. Um, if, if, if this housing is um, allowed to go forward, but only if it's less housing, because ultimately that's what the zoning does. It doesn't, it's not designed to protect tenants from displacement. It's designed to protect neighborhood character um, to maintain the, um, you know, the, 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 the neighborhood character to, to yeah, the, you know, yeah. To, to have buildings look more alike to each other to be of similar yeah. height and so on. And so we said the worst case scenario would be if nothing is done for the tenants, it's still going to be converted to something else, but we limit the, um, we don't allow the variances, we, we, we limit the increases in height and so on. Well, what happened? What happened was actually the developer went nuanced statements about whether or not it's a win overall. Um, but the the developer went to council and said, okay, um, I have a proposal now that is, you know, just the townhomes. It was a dramatic decrease in the number of units. Uh, no change in the displacement at all. So that's what happened in that case. And the reason why that happened is that the tools that we have are not designed to protect tenants. They're designed to, um, so that is the, the zoning tools we have are not designed to protect tenants. They're designed to, um, you know, protect the aesthetics of yeah. our neighborhood so that, you know, you, you don't have to see a so-called monstrosity. Which of, doesn't do people searching for housing any good at all. Yeah, I, I think that ultimately, you know, that's, 
I mean, part of it's, uh, I, I mean, it's just kind of an empirical question and I can kind of, yeah. um, I could maybe email you some links that you want to put on. Do the, that. In the um, background that, you know, that. Tell people quickly um, how to get a hold of you because we are actually out of time. We've, we've been doing well, this for an, an hour. So um, how can people get a hold of WREMB? Yeah, so if you want to get a hold of us, the uh, the best ways are just to, to go um, to, you can either message us on Facebook. We're at Waterloo Region YIMBY on, on Facebook. You can message us on Twitter, uh, Waterloo Region YIMBY, or you can uh, email us at, um, at uh, Waterloo Region YIMBY, uh, dot org. So, so, sorry. <laughs> not, not I'll have it all w on the web page. WRYMB. Yeah. Go to radiowaterloo.ca slash CCC to get all the information and then yes. uh, it'll be there for you. Hopefully we'll have this up as a podcast, as a vidcast um, in fairly short order. You've been listening to CKMS Community Connections. My name is Bob Junk. We've been talking to Martin Asling from wrnimbi.com. Yes, in my backyard about housing issues in Waterloo region and across the province. CKMS Community Connections is sponsored by Radio Waterloo. Executive producer is Jennifer Strong. My name is Bob Jonkman. Next Friday, we'll have all new music, including the new album from The Boys and I. See you next week. Thank you.